of the first option, the, one of the first options was uh, to begin ridding the access or the excess amounts of food through uh, destruction and that kind of ruffled some feathers. Um, and so it didn't really fall through, but the later on in 1939, it owes a, a lot of the shape to the New Deal collaboration between government and the private sector. Um, so the institution of these orange and blue food stamps uh, up to the top right were seen as certain incentive programs where orange stamps were, were purchased and for every dollar spent, you got a blue stamp, which the blue stamps would go towards the, the surplus foods that farmers were trying to get rid of and essentially get people back on, on their feet. And so when the destruction idea failed, these were implemented. And so it was intended to raise the incomes of farmers by distributing surplus farm commodities and as well to help the poor. Um, so initially the food stamps program was widely accepted and favored um, as plenty of participants believe that the program offered freedom of food choice and not just the surplus. Julie, you can go to the next slide. So coming into the 1960s, um, President John F. Kennedy proposed uh, an expansion of uh, making permanent small government pilot program to address the domestic hunger called the food stamps program. Uh, President Johnson carried it through and he passed the Food Stamps Act of 1964. And this is widely seen as the beginning of uh, Johnson's war on poverty. Um, so it was part of the Great Society program and the goal was to achieve a more effective use of agricultural overproduction, improve levels of nutrition among individuals with low incomes, and then also strengthen the agricultural economy. And around this time, we were interested in uh, what other groups- Another one just came out. Uh, but other groups were uh, trying to organize around uh, a public health, a public hunger epidemic. Um, and so found in, in much smaller demographic groups like women, particular mothers, and then other marginalized pro, uh, populations, this sort of advocacy began at certain grassroots efforts. And so in the 1960s, the rhetoric shifted from women's and men's dependence and need and therefore blame toward into, turned into a public and fundamental desire for the right to food. This area of social movement activism included activism around hunger and, and this is where led by women, um, ideas such as a, a group called Operation Life, which used donations and USDA surplus food to operate a clinic and some food program in, in Las Vegas. Um, another instance in Memphis, a group of poor women worked in concert with local physicians to treat hunger itself and see uh, malnourishment and, and try and do so at, at a grassroots effort. Um, another group of rural black sharecroppers turned to cooperative organization and public gardens to offset hunger. Uh, and due to unreliable incomes. The most famous of these efforts came from the Black Panther Party's Breakfast Project, which fed tens of thousands of children in dozens of cities and therefore kind of became a major distraction to the FBI. But many of these programs emphasize what we might call a food sovereignty, the right to feed food or feed people. Uh, it was just one facet of, of wealth of social programs created by the Black Panther Party and it helped contribute to the existence of free, fret, free federal breakfast programs today. Um, one interesting aspect of this is that it took a while for faith-based groups to get involved with uh, this sort of advocacy. Um, the first one was the Washington Interreligious Staff Council was formed in 1968. And in the next few decades, uh, you got to see groups like Bread for the World or Interreligious Task Force on US Food Policy. And so 
what I wanted to just highlight is, you know, there are some some groups that one would think they they would be quick to jump onto this, um, including the church. And it was a bit behind in grassroots community organizing efforts that were in high impact areas due to certain marginalized groups. And Angel, you can move to the next slide. So the 1980s and into the, the early 2000s, there was general pushback against food stamps programming uh, surfacing in the 1980s, uh, seeing recipients as lazy, not hardworking, and at times not deserving of food or certain state benefits of food. Um, stricter requirements were also placed on the SNAP or the food stamps program, like gross income eligibility tests, a state option to require a job search of applicants as well as participants, and certain disqualification periods. And in the first term of the Reagan administration, the omnibus Budget Reconciliation Act of 1981 passed and significantly cut the food states stamps program. And these cuts and in the recession fell on a lot of social programs, including food assistance. Um, the movement then shifted to reliance on the private sector, mostly charity, in order to fulfill the needs of hunger and kind of uh, challenge the overreaching hand of government. Moving into the late 1990s, participation in the food stamps program declined due to falling unemployment and changes to the Personal Responsibility and Work Operation Opportunities Reconciliation Act, uh, which really just kind of set the, the tone for President Clinton to start to define the solution to poverty as participating in the market as a worker particularly for poor women with children who were the primary beneficiaries of the cash and food assistance. At around this time, food stamps rolls plummeted after 1996, falling from 25 million in 1995 to just below 17 million in 2000. And Angel, you can move on. So the current snapshot, um, late 2000s into, into right now, um, the food stamps really owe a great deal to Republican presidents. George W. Bush expanded the food stamps, particularly in the 2002 Farm Bill that restored eligibility for legal immigrants. Um, the name changed officially to the Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program, or SNAP, in 2008. Um, and then moving into the past few years, uh, coming out of a pandemic, in 2020, during the first three months of the pandemic, over 6 million Americans enrolled in the SNAP program. And since then, nearly 8 million have fallen below the poverty line. Um, certain public health emergency policies were, were enacted. The Families First Coronavirus Response Act raised SNAP benefit allotments to maximum benefit. Uh, due to the, the household size, the American Rescue Plan in, increased SNAP benefits by 15% in 2021. The White House Executive Order reevaluated the Thrifty Food Plan and lead, led to one of the largest increases in SNAP benefits, uh, and so on and so forth. And so one of the things that is has occurred is these SNAP benefit programs have kind of fallen off uh, as of March 1st of this year, uh, came to an end reverting to pre-pandemic offerings. And so this affects emergency allotments, college students, work requirements, et cetera. And so to finish off that, there's general consensus around, um, you know, there's, there's a, a, a group and then a strong effort that uh, are putting forth proposals to cut SNAP by $80 billion to $150 billion over the next decade. And that's kind of the snap where we might be going with this um, as far as our current standings. And so that's a little bit of the, the background. I'll, I'll hand it off to Aaron to kind of start bringing us around for what he's got to say. All right. Thanks, Austin. Um, <clears throat> so I just want to spend a little bit of time 
talking about three things, kind of like noticing some of the ways in which public guaranteed food security has worked well when federal policy is well funded in, in this effort. Um, two, some notice some things about how work requirements in the in the research literature have been shown to not work well. And then to basically ask the question, as we kind of look at the current policy landscape and the policy fights that are happening this year, what are the what are the corporate interests or reasons why cor like corporate interests might align with uh, w with an expansion of work requirements despite kind of what the research literature says? Um, so so the first thing I kind of want to emphasize, and we can go ahead, uh, Angel, and and we had uh, we were going to show you a clip. It didn't quite work out. Um, the general consensus in the literature around food security is that the war on poverty programs of the 60s, uh, in, you know, the Food Stamp Act that President Johnson passed and others, um, broadly were effective in eradicating severe hunger in the United States. And I think one of the most poignant facts that I ran across was just how different the kind of food assistance charity landscape was in that time versus now. In 1980, there were only 200 food banks in the entire United States because the public assistance apparatus for food security was robust enough that people were able to rely on that and just shop at their grocery store. And today, there's over 40,000 food assistance organizations in the United States. And that is the legacy of the shift in policy that the United States has traveled through kind of the era of neoliberalism from 1980s until today with kind of the rise of kind of uh, President Reagan and Bush's economics in those time periods um, and some of the, the things that Austin was talking about in terms of how funding cuts and work requirements were applied to these programs in the 80s and 90s. That precipitated a major shift to a more kind of privatized chari charity based approach to food assistance. The other thing that I just wanted to highlight from like a macro perspective is that SNAP is seen as one of the most effective policy tools that uh, our federal government has to responding to economic downturns in general, because they are what's called a counter cyclical program when people are experiencing an economic crunch and become eligible for SNAP and those funds are transferred to them, they're able to immediately spend those out into their local, you know, local economies. And so an increase in, even though a lot of that is mopped up by large corporations, an increase in SNAP funding during economic downturns is basically like a 150% bang for your buck. Uh, from the federal government's perspective, and it supports the creation of new jobs and economic downturns. So not only is it, uh, has it been shown in our past history to be an effective way of providing for like guaranteed food security, in, you know, nationally, it's also been proven to be an effective tool for mitigating the impact of hard economic times. Um, now, now I want to talk a little bit about work requirements. So work requirements have been uh, and kind of the, the main kind of corporate backed intervention into this kind of public food assistance uh, policy regime since the 80s. And what studies have consistently shown is that work requirements in a benefits program like this are not properly targeted to the to the reality of participants' lives and actually kind of indiscriminately harm folks who need food assistance. It's what what studies shows that 75% of able-bodied folks who and when we're talking about work requirements, a lot of folks in SNAP are children, are uh, elderly people on Social Security, are folks with uh, varying degrees of physical ability. And then there's a, a small slice of that pie, a, a relatively smaller slice of that pie that the government defines as able-bodied without dependents. Um, and those individuals are the individuals being targeted by work requirement policy reform ideas from the right. Um, and so 75% of those folks 
statistically already work. And they're just receiving wages that are so depressed that they qualify for SNAP despite working. Oftentimes, these work requirements uh, apply to folks who have part-time jobs or uh, have to stitch together multiple jobs. Um, and specifically with households with children, 90% of, of those folks are already working, but they are also income-wise un, under, uh, under the cap. And what, what these broad economic studies have shown is that when, that, that when work requirements are expanded or made more aggressive, it causes decreases in participation, um, in, in program participation by 53%, and uh, can cause like immediate exit of the about a quarter of programs, so, like a quarter of the participants to immediately be like a like pretty shortly thereafter be ejected from the program, and like in a sterile environment when we're thinking about these, a lot of times uh, it's imagined that these will be like properly targeted by the administrative state, um, but the the reality of how these play out is that. Uh, it, it's a little bit more random than that. Whether or not folks actually meet the requirements set in the policy does not necessarily guarantee that they'll stay in the program because what ends up happening is a more kind of random application of the administrative state's paperwork requirements and process requirements to eject folks who aren't don't have kind of the time and experience navigating these structures to properly kind of certify that they meet the requirements to retain their benefits. And so like the, the, broad, the broad picture that's been seen by the research is that folks who, who get ejected in, these, in, in kind of these policy reform cycles where we apply stricter work requirements to these programs uh, are, are not necessarily even the folks who those work requirements are trying to eject from the program. But I wanna zoom out from kind of some of the criticisms that have been made of work requirements as a policy intervention to think a little bit more about why corporate interests might be aligned with this type of intervention. Um, broadly, I think we can kind of draw a pretty direct line from the 80s until now of like corporate interests are generally interested in lower taxes, which require cuts to uh, you know, revenue driven programs like food assistance. And so there's a pretty direct line there of like those corporate interests want lower taxes to get lower taxes, they have to cut programs. So they're interested in finding ways to cut down the amount of funding that we expend on something like food assistance. But the wrinkle in that is that a lot of major corporations, and I'm just gonna do kind of a case study of Kroger as an example, also rely on SNAP to supplement the incomes of their uh, workers who receive depressed wages. And so recently, in the past few years, the, the United Food and Commercial Workers Union did a survey of 37,000 Kroger workers in the Pacific Northwest. They found that 75,000% of those folks are food insecure. And that's while working at Kroger. And among single parents who work at Kroger in that region, 85% were food insecure. That's seven times the national average. And part of the factor of why that is, is that Kroger pays $16 per hour on average in that region when li a living wage would be $22 an hour. And so we can ask the question on the one hand, why would, if, if large corporations are relying on SNAP to uh, ensure that they can pay their workers a depressed wage and those workers still be able to eat, why would corporate interests, which tend to be broadly aligned with the political forces that do push for work requirements and other kind of funding cuts to public assistance and food uh, be aligned, you know, with, with that kind of, um, with that kind of intervention. And one of the things that I've kind of wanted to highlight in this conversation is the fact that when a food benefit like this is predicated on a kind of string, a stringently ap applied work requirement, it gives the corporation more control over their workers in the same way that healthcare that's provided by your workplace instead of by the government gives your workplace more leverage over you as a worker. Because if your healthcare is predicated on you retaining your job, if your food assistance that you rely on is predicated on retaining your current job, that much more radically limits your ability to consider 
going into a transition period to try to find a new or better job with a better wage, because in that period of time, you will be at risk of losing your food assistance that you may a lot rely on, losing your health care that you may rely on. And so these types of policies also serve as a reinforcement of corporate control over workers, rather than in the cases where these types of public policies are applied in a way that is not associated with your workplace and with you retaining your current employment. In those policy scenarios, folks who rely on these types of food assistance or healthcare, you know, healthcare provision have greater leverage to be able to explore a transition to a different workplace that might offer a higher wage. Those types of policy environments give workers more agency. And so that I think a lot of times in this in, in this conversation around these types of policies, the focus goes on kind of the narrow merits and and you know the the pros and cons of whether work requirements cause people to work more or not. Um, and doesn't focus as much on how do those shape the power dynamics of what agency folks who who need these benefits to maintain, you know, their livelihoods have over their ability to secure better wages or their bargaining position in relation to the corporate interests that are oftentimes exploiting them and and giving them like lower wages than they than they can live on. Um, so that's kind of the power analysis that I that I kind of wanted to to put in front of us in relation to the impulse in our culture generally to rely on uh, some some of these more conservative policy interventions when it comes to food assistance. Thanks, Aaron. Um, I know there's been some comments and chatter in the chat. Um, we got like a couple more points to get through and I think we'll open it up. Um, I wanted to give a brief overview um, on this kind of um, concept and call to action on the right to food, um, which if you're interested, we're gonna send by the way, a whole resource sheet that has links to articles and information that we've cited here um, in this webinar. So there'll be a lot of follow-up information for you. One of them um, is the National Right to, uh, to Food Community of Practice. Um, and that is a lot of um, make, it's a makeup of a lot of different um, food justice workers throughout the state and, or sorry, throughout the country. Um, but it is a call to action and a legal framework for coordinated reform in food, agriculture, health, labor and the environment. Um, the most important thing to kind of highlight here is that um, the US government has declined to ratify the International Covenant on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights, which recognizes the right to food, claiming that existing social safety net and federal laws safeguards against hunger. That's something that the US has not um, ratified or adopted. So by not codifying this right to food, the US has created conditions whereby control over land, seeds and inputs are increasingly consolidated, Workers are exploited, um, much like the Kroger example that Aaron gave um, all along the food chain and racial justice is further entrenched and climate change is accelerated. Um, so we're looking for a right to adequate food and nutrition um, that might be considered as a legal framework that supports self-determination and supports food sovereignty over, um, over charity and over um, just certain other ways to access food. Um, can you, hit the next slide. I just wanted to highlight this quickly because it's just it looks like a lot of jargon, but basically that it is recognized um, in the 48 Universal Declaration of Human Rights um, and in the 1966 International Covenant on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights, um, which affirms the right of every person to an adequate standard of living, which includes food um, as part of that adequate standard of living. Um, and it's similar to the language that um, was set up in the 60s when um, this documentary came out around hunger, that it is a right and that we're not achieving that in the US. And it is what kickstarted SNAP, um, this kind of language to encourage folks to think about, encourage people in the country to support something like SNAP that eventually landed and almost eradicated hunger. Next slide. Um, the important piece of the right to food is that um, it is not a right to be fed and it's not suggesting um, a, this governmental mandate to hand out food to everyone. It's more that um, a right that would exist to protect self-determination, to protect um, someone's ability to procure their own food, either by their own means of growing it or by purchasing it on their own. 
um, and it would require states to provide an enabling environment in which people can use their full potential to produce or procure adequate food for themselves and their families. So it's really more of a way of seeing that everyone has a right to um, procure their own food and to have the means in which to do that on their own, um, rather than depending on um, governmental, uh, or excuse me, um, food banks or, you know, emergency food assistance um, that is needed. And definitely we still need those systems in place to get people um, the food that they need to survive and to thrive. But the right to food kind of looks beyond that and says, what can we do to maintain that structure for families and for individuals to maintain, to gain, gain that food themselves? Um, so um, these are kind of some questions for consideration um, for everyone here. Um, considering this right to food, what could it say about SNAP and work requirements? Um, not necessarily that it would need to, you know, um, demolish or underturn everything, but what could this kind of commitment around right to food say about SNAP? And how does the right to food challenge our social constructions, um, especially around SNAP? I think what we'll do Erin, um, for the sake of time, maybe you can go through these things and we can pull up those questions again at the end. Okay, sure. Um, yeah, I'm just gonna give a, a quick rundown of some of the policy kind of landscape that's happening this year. This is a hotly contested issue, um, both because this year is the year that Congress is working on the Farm Bill and also uh, to the extent that you <laughs> want to go through the pain of following policy news in DC, you may have been paying attention to the bigger struggle around the budget deal a, a month or two back. Um, in that, in the in the deal that was struck, uh, I believe it was in May, uh, around uh, what I'm calling the default cliff, um, has also been termed the debt ceiling in. Um, the and, and the budget deal that was that was struck to resolve it uh work requirements were the the maximum age to which work requirements are applied was raised from 49 to 54 in in snap um this is creating a new work requirement for about 750,000 participants specifically in an age range where health issues uh are more pre more prevalent and cause more folks to uh you know have to uh, shift between working and not working because, you know, of health complications. Um, so analysis from kind of independent researchers is, is estimating it could about could put about 750,000 folks in that age bracket at risk of losing their SNAP benefits. However, in that deal that was struck, there were also new exemptions created for folks who are unhomed, for veterans, and for foster children. Uh, for for folks who have been in the foster system who have recently aged out of the foster system, uh, foster care system, and so when those you know those folks being able to access SNAP in a new way because of those exemptions will ultimately likely result in a net increase of about seventy eight thousand participants in SNAP. So that kind of bargaining structure within DC circles is kind of being seen as like a shrewd bargaining move on the part of the Biden administration in terms of being able to increase eligibility for some folks, but that does come at the expense of some other folks. And, and that's a rough trade-off that didn't, didn't need to happen. Um, you could imagine a world where we create exemptions for those popu vulnerable populations and also not put 750,000 folks age 50 to 55 at risk of lo losing their SNAP benefits. Um, but that was the deal that was struck in, in, the, in the budget negotiation. Negotiations. In the upcoming farm bill, uh, there are going to be additional attempts to um, apply more stringent work requirements and funding cuts to SNAP. Um, just because that budget deal was struck doesn't mean that there won't be forces in Congress that push for more. And there will also be a lot of forces in Congress that push for that being the extent of changes to SNAP. So that will be one of the biggest fights in, in the farm bill. Some of the proposals that have been put out by folks who are in favor of um, of more restrictions to SNAP and food assistance include ra raising those work requirements to age 65 instead of age 54. Um, and also a proposal from the Republican Study Committee, which includes a lot of the folks on the uh, uh, 
House Agriculture Committee um, that would propose converting SNAP to a block grant. And I'll be pretty transparent with you. That's like kind of on the fringe um, in terms of its possibility of actually happening. It could show up in the House side of the farm bill, but that doesn't mean that, um, you know, because there's a divided government where Democrats control the Senate and, and Republicans control the House, I don't see that as coming to pass, but it's il illustrative of uh, an, an example of the type of uh, agenda that comes with really like taking a restrictive approach to SNAP to its uh, to its highest level. We've seen the block grant approach apply, applied to a program like TANF and how that results in a lot of that cash assistance that should go to folks who need it getting soaked up um, by states and applied to other programs other than just uh, devoting cash assistance to folks who need cash assistance. And if that type of approach was applied to SNAP, there would be concerns, A, that those block grants would not grow with inflation and not grow with changing times as has happened with TANF and that states uh, would divert some of those funds from providing direct food assistance to folks to other uh, you know, kind of allowed interventions as has happened in TANF and water down the amount of funds that actually get to folks to help them buy food. So that is, that is the, the landscape of some of the attempts to change uh, how SNAP works and there will be folks in Congress who strongly oppose this and advocate for increases in SNAP funding and or just like retaining the structure of SNAP that we have today. All right. Um... Thank you. I know that was kind of like a lot of overview. Um, why don't you exit um, screen share, uh, Angel? That way we can kind of just pull back for a second. Um, are there any any questions related to what we presented? I see one in the chat. Maybe we can address that one. Um, what would be the repercussions of changing to a block grant? Oh, you had already addressed it. Sorry. Hello. Can you hear me? Yes. Can I, um, I need to log out and log right back in because I had an incoming call that reduced my volume on my end so I could barely hear you all. I'll have to log back in to to uh, to adjust the level of the volume. Okay. Any other questions? Kind of reactions to some of the information shared. Well, there was a lot of talk about the um, work requirements, and I put this in the chat as well, corporations are not just using it as a chokehold for their employees. Housing authority counts SNAP as income. And even though you can't use SNAP to pay your rent, it counts as part of the 30% that people owe. And so in some states, you're, they literally it raises your rent if you get SNAP, and then if you also have a job on top of it, you're, it puts you hustling behind the eight ball. So, and that mostly affects single parents. Um, and so literally those work requirements end up starving children, people who are not able to work at all. All right, thank you for that. Dan, can you hear us better? Did you have a question? Yes, I can hear you better. Um, I guess I probably have a, a, a number of questions, but I'm trying to, to figure out, are we saying that work requirements are, are hurting uh, the, the overall issue or work requirements helping? Because I'm, I'm pro work requirements. Um, I'm an ABOT myself. And one of the reasons I'm pro work, work requirements is because it allowed me to, at the time when I was required to 
do work requirements to to uh, maintain my food stamps for like three months. I was uh, trying to um, I was trying sorry, I was trying to figure out how those work requirements could align with my current passion, which was learning agriculture, getting into gardening. So, and at that time, I was learning that the farmers I was working with, the biggest issues was that labor, right? So I'm like, well, this, if these are labor issues you're having, why aren't their organizations pushing so that we could utilize our work requirements to assist these uh, farmers in these urban or rural areas? That was not happening. People was just more so stuck on like WEBT for these individuals here. There was more so uh, focused on uh, really here. We didn't, if we were not even, I guess by the local organizations that was supposed to push the work requirements, we were not even encouraged more so to uh, maintain our, our work requirements. So I was, I basically saw it as something that could be utilized to help address these food desert issues and things of that nature. And the reason I posted the Agriculture Act of 1973 is because that was when we were able to purchase seeds and fruit bearing plants with our EBT. So at the time when I'm when I'm required to do these work requirements, I was I found organizations like uh, nonprofits of farms or places of garden where I, I would go buy my seeds and literally utilize that to help grow what we we're doing at that particular place. So I'm helping with growing in the area, but I'm utilizing my work requirements to do that. And that also prompted me to uh, start like a nonprofit where I'm dope now. I'm literally my work requirements are met just by me working for the nonprofit that we started. So I'm just trying to figure out how are we missing these other areas of progress with work requirements when you know the issue is we've always been called you know in in these underserved areas lazy people don't want to work don't want to do this but who is educating us from the aspect of of utilizing work requirements to be better you know we get these narratives that come from outside of our community but we never get the story of the individuals who are actually in the communities actually doing some of this work to help alleviate these issues So I'll, I'll respond to that. A, I just, I want to acknowledge and honor what you're saying that you feel like in your life, the, the need to uh, meet your work requirement, you were able to align with your passion and that worked out for you. Um, I'm glad that, that that worked out for you. I think from a macro sense, when we study how these work requirement policies impact a broad swath of people, the consensus seems to be that the majority of folks are uh, harmed in not necessarily a like in, in kind of an indiscriminate and random way. And so this raises the question, especially since we're kind of putting this in the lens of a right to food. Um, part of, I think, the conversation that we're trying to start or have here is that uh, is changing the cultural narratives we have around what a world might look like where we make sure that uh, everyone in our society has sufficient resources to uh, exert their own agency around securing the food they need. And that's part of why we brought up the history of SNAP in the 60s and 70s before its uh, you know, funding levels were diluted and the landscape in that time period when more folks were able to get the SNAP benefits that they needed, go to the store and buy food. Um, and that doesn't necessarily have to hook up with also policy interventions that we might want to pursue around providing avenues for folks to secure work or build new skills the the issue comes when we make one contingent upon the other in a way that is applied ineffectively to end up penalizing people who have a lot of things on their plate i think the care economy here was mentioned a lot of folks are balancing caring for multiple folks do also fall under this um 
under the categorization where they need to meet a work requirement, maybe are already working one or two jobs, but like between everything that's happening end up falling through the cracks of the system because they're not able to certify to the government that they're meeting the requirement, lose their foods, food assistance and can be put in a much more precarious situation. And the other thing that I would just highlight um, around the idea that Dan, you mentioned that I hear your passion about of like, hey, folks who have to meet a work requirement, how can we get you connected to local agriculture? That sounds like a great idea in practice that kind of like intentional engagement with folks around how to meet their work requirements is not included in the policy design. Instead, the policy design is applied as a way to eject people out of the program to achieve a funding cut without the kind of intentional wraparound support to make sure that folks can get connected to the kind of career development avenues that you're mentioning. And so, what that the question that ultimately raises is would a better approach to securing broad kind of flourishing for all folks in our society given the amount of wealth that our society has as a whole be better served by making sure that in this corner everyone has the resources they need to exert the agency to get the food that they need and then separately that we also apply smart well-targeted policy interventions to make sure that folks can find career pathways that are meaningful and and that uh, align with their passions. We can do both. They don't have to be connected together in a way that penalizes people because of in administrative shortfalls for an agenda of underfunding public welfare provision in our country. So that's just painting a picture of a world we could imagine where we did things differently. And also, everybody's not passionate about farming, and everybody doesn't have access to land to create agriculture. People in public housing who also get staff assistance are not always allowed to even grow a flower, let alone a mini garden, in their, their little corner of that project apartment. So it's not, you can't base what you do for the whole off of one individual's success at a thing. I understand. Um, well, we are coming close to our time. And um, like I said, you know, in an hour, there's not much we can do to unpack all every single element of this, but it's just really to kind of um, open the conversation and to kind of evaluate the connections between um, SNAP and work requirements, corporate power, wages, um, that sort of thing. So we really just hope that this was just a way to think about some of these things. Um, I'm going to be sending out uh, a resource guide to everyone via email that if, if this was of interest and you want to read more about it, I know there were some questions, like some specific questions listed in the chat that we may, may, maybe didn't get to, but would love to kind of research more. Um, we're happy to kind of um, continue that conversation. Please fill out the evaluation. That's really important for us. And there are other topics if, if folks are interested in learning more about um, pieces kind of related to this or digging deeper further into a certain topic that we brought up we're happy to have that conversation and we want to create content and space that um, makes sense for you all um, as participants so please uh, fill, fill out that evaluation and let us know um, what else you might be interested in learning um, and yeah we thank you so much for your time with us today